Welcome to the Psych Central Show, where each episode presents an in-depth look at issues from the fields of psychology and mental health. With your host, Gabe Howard, and featuring Vincent M. Wales. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Psych Central Show. My name is Gabe Howard, and we are on part two of a three-part series of the Palo Alto Suicides. And we have some new guests with us, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Wales to go ahead and introduce everybody and bring us together. Thank you, sir. Um, returning with us this time is Sammy Cottmel. Hi, Sammy. Hi. We also have Michael Fitzgerald. Michael is the Executive Director of Behavioral Health Services at El Camino Hospital in Mountain View. Hi, Michael. Hi there. Thanks for joining us on the show. Back in 2009, if, if I have all, this, uh, have all this straight, Michael, after the first rash of suicides in the, in the Palo Alto School District, your hospital launched the Aspire program. Is that correct? Yes, we did. Can you tell us what Aspire is and where the idea came from? Right. That's, it stands for uh, After School Program Interventions and Resilience to Education, but that's hard to remember, so we just go by the acronym <laughs> FIRE. And uh, awesome. it's just coincidental, right? Uh, entirely coincidental. No, it, uh, we wanted to get that word in there and, and figure out how to, how to work it. But really, it does kind of speak to what it is. The goal is you know, we look, we're looking to see what was causing, um, and, and I want to stress, even though it was uh, the suicides were obviously a, a, a huge concern, major tragedy in the community and for all the families, obviously everybody impacted. Um, there's a lot more going on than that. It really has to do with all the youth that were experiencing enormous, enormous um, crises uh, of anxiety, depression that we're seeing throughout Silicon Valley. And I've heard from many communities since then around the country that have experienced similar, you know, sort of rates of this, of this sort of what's been called an epidemic. Of, uh, of teenage anxiety. Focusing a little bit away from the suicides for this purpose is important to understand because suicide itself is a behavior. It's an, it's an outcome of behavior. It is, uh, uh, and other people may express other behaviors relative to their anxiety. So that's, a, that's an important point. Uh, so we, we uh, but, but, you know, obviously because of the suicides, it got incredible attention. Sure. And, uh, you know, we wanted to respond. Uh, we, at our hospital, we've been providing mental health services for adults um, since the hospital opened in 1961 uh, and uh, has been uh, uh, started some outpatient programs, a couple of them for adults only, fairly small originally, and uh, but had never done anything for youth in all those years uh, from, from 1961 to uh, 2008. So we brought together a task force to really see what should we do, you know, what can we as a hospital do? and. A lot of calls came for people who came to the task force. We invited, obviously, school officials. We invited, we had a youth a member. Uh, we had uh, various not-for-profits come. Uh, various uh, practitioners in the community came. And so we, the initial call we heard was to build a psychiatric hospital for youth. And that was not going to happen, obviously, very quickly. And also, we didn't feel that that was necessarily um, going to address the issue as much. Uh, hospitalizations tend to be brief. Uh, it's basically just to deal with the immediate crisis. It doesn't address what's going on really with the young person. So we wanted to right. do something that's going to have a little bit more change. So uh, that's that's how we got started with that process and ended up with, uh, with the Spire. What I really like about what you said there, Michael, was that the knee-jerk reaction is we need more beds, we need more hospitalization, but people don't live in hospitals. People don't live under watch. We, we go out in the community and we do things and we need skills. So could I describe the Aspire program as, as teaching skills to people so that they can live on their own and get past the crisis versus? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is it's skill based. Uh, we really value that piece of it for a lot of reasons. I, I don't know so much of it's um, even teaching so much as, it, as incorporating. Uh, Sammy, you, you could you could certainly address this from, from your experience, but it's not like they're sitting there learning the skills and then writing them down the book and, and okay, now they're good to right. go. It's, it's expressed differently with each 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 youth, each family. And, and Sammy, could you address that a little bit? I think what was really, really different about the Aspire program um, was that just kind of being with other teams and going through these modules together, um, it really, you know, kind of 
made me feel like I wasn't alone, you know, and that we were all kind of going through these things together. And it just created a really supportive environment. And I think sometimes it's hard, I, I think, for a lot of teens to hear things from, you know, an adult and kind of really take that into consideration. And I think that having the teens there to talk about, you know, their experiences is really valuable in that sense. I know for me, it's just, it was just really great to um, experience things with other teens. Yeah, that, that describes it pretty well. And, and the nature, when we went to look at other places to see, um, you know, what is treatment look like even for, for uh, teens, we, did, we had no experience with this at all and we wanted to do it right. I mean, we have a golden opportunity. It's a, it's a NOVA program, right? We hadn't done it before. Okay. We had this great group of people that came together. There's tremendous energy in the community and a real desire by the organization from the board level on down to do it and do it right. And so we did look at myself and, and our psychiatrist at the time, Jennifer Zamarga, we went around to uh, various places that provided uh, programs, uh, you know, a partial hospitalization or intensive outpatient program. It's the outpatient mechanism this is. I can talk about that in a minute uh, if you have any further questions about that. But uh, what we found was is that places we went, um, the, the teens got better. Um, they, they got better and they were discharged. And so a couple of questions I had, well, what's working? Why, tell me how it is they're getting better. And the only thing I could really come up with from virtually everything that we looked at at places we visited was they got better because the crisis passed and they got a lot of support from their families and from everybody that engaged with them and connected with therapy and, and that. And so that was great, uh, but that didn't, I didn't feel like that was going to be enough, right? Because what happens when the next crisis comes and the family isn't there, you know, the friends have changed. You know, how is the youth, the young person, going to handle that crisis? And I could not get really a feel for what that would be like. And uh, the other piece of it was the discharge criteria was that the insurance companies stopped paying. That's all they would get for authorization, which to me was a little different because if that's why they're being discharged, were they really ready to be discharged even? And I think from the treatment, uh, defense of the treatment providers, they were saying, well, we're going to give as much care as we can. I mean, that's where they were coming from. But I didn't feel like that was a validation of the uh, of what the youth were going through because to be discharged because insurance stopped paying, it just on the you know where is that sense of this is what I've done here's how I've, I've moved forward. So that was right. people people left. So the uh, angle that we went at it with was to teach the kids skills or have the kids learn and engage in skills that uh, we're going to manage a crisis as, as they come because it is inevitable. Uh, growing yeah. up and just living life, right? That you're going to find crises in your life. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think to kind of add on to the, you know, what the skills that we kind of learned at the program, you know, I think one of the most useful things that, you know, they, it kind of taught us was this idea of using this thing called our, called our wise mind, because sometimes teens get stuck in, you know, two different tracks of thought. You know, you have your uh, emotional mind and you have your rational mind. So for me, when, I got the B, um, I was completely overwhelmed by my emotions and my emotional mind and was convinced you know, that life just wasn't worth living. And so I think what the Aspire program did that was really amazing was it enabled me to take a step back from being in this high emotional state and realize that in, you know, in three years time, getting this B really wouldn't matter at all. So I think the Aspire program definitely was really helpful for teens because it helped them, you know, kind of look at the world in a more balanced way, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Nice. So, Michael, since this program was implemented, approximately how many students have, have gone through it? Uh, that's a great question. Um, let's see, it's about about 50 per program a year. So uh, let's, uh, we started with just the one program in 2010, I guess we opened that up. And then we opened one up the following year in Los Gatos. And so that would have been then 100, so 50 to 100 a year. So that's now 2016. So maybe, maybe what does that sound like, about 500 or so? But now we've opened up, well, we've got a total of five programs now. We opened oh, up, wow. Uh, yeah. yeah, we opened up three more last year. Um, one for Thank middle you. schoolers, uh, which is uh, filled up pretty quick with that group. I thought it might. And then uh, there's a lot of calls for that. And then uh, we have a uh, one that opened up for youth who are 18 to 25. And uh, the older I get, the younger they look. Uh, <laughs> that, me uh, too. Me too. You'll get, you'll get there someday, Sammy. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, not the greatest feeling, actually, but uh, they do look pretty young now. They're going through a lot of stuff. I mean, the brain's still developing. Uh, you know, anybody who's got kids that age or young people that age, I mean, understand that it's uh, it's still a process. And that's that's built as well. We actually take up to 12 uh, in that program, which is, uh, you know, a lot more than we do with the younger groups. But uh, And then we have a, a preparatory program that's opened up as well, and we'll go up to six in that group. So, uh, And these are for youth that are not ready to join the teen program yet, the 13 to uh, sort of 18 group high school program, but because they're just not able to be in a group or there's, you know, still smoking a lot of pot, can't quite uh, let that go, and so we kind of we kind of work with them and engage them, and 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 uh, we've been pretty successful. But over half of those, about sixty percent of those uh, youth do uh, are able to join the Aspire program. So we've uh, felt like here they they weren't able to go, and now they can, and uh, so that's uh, been very helpful. That's fantastic. Now, given the the expansion rate that that you just talked about, it sounds like the program is very successful. But the question that comes to my mind is, how do you measure the success rate of a program like Aspire? That's a great question. So we, at the onset, we thought, well, how do you do it? And again, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, yeah, we do uh, anxiety sc- uh, scales and depression scales and the scores get better, but that's not the issue. You know, that does drop. You know, you do go through that. It's what happens in a crisis. So how do you measure that? And so uh, a couple things that, uh, you know, we do have the diary card, you know, so they, they, yeah. they uh, rate themselves if they're using the skills and, and to the degree they use them and did they incorporate them. And they're using them with, at the ultimate level. It's kind of like different layers of Zen, I suppose. Uh, at some point, she was at uh, Sam. We should call it DDT Zen, maybe something like that. But <laughs> you get to the, you get to this, a score of seven, uh, which basically means you used it and you didn't think about it. So now it's fully incorporated. And if you th- and if you think back to our own youth, anybody's youth, any, anybody on this call, anybody listening to this uh, to this broadcast, you didn't have these skills out of, out of out of birth, right? I mean, you had to develop them. Things that really upset you when you were a teenager don't upset you now typically right they don't because you learned this kind of maturity skills and 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 these things that you learn over time so we wanted to measure that we want to measure people's ability to just respond differently to things that happen and so we sent out questionnaires mailed them it turns out nobody has stamps or envelopes or maybe not even pins anymore we would and we didn't get anything back we got some we still get them back we send them out and get them back but it's not very many not enough in there the results were good and what we are measuring is, uh, from both the parent and the youth, each get a letter, is are they using the skills still? That's really where we were at. Are they using these skills that they learned? And what we found was, is they do. The other thing we found is that over time, they didn't conceive them really as skills. So they didn't, they, it was just incorporated in. And that's that was almost, we wanted to see that result, where they weren't trying to use them or identifying them as skills. It was just part of who they were. So that we thought that was very positive. But again, it was, I think it's the right measure, but it's hard to get. So looking at other ways of retrieving that data through, I don't know, maybe an app or something, and I'm not a big fan of that. A lot of work we do with the kids is to get them away from their, from their apps and their mind control devices. <laughs> mm, right. Uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, so we're still playing with that. And then we're looking at some other things. We're just starting an outcome measure right now that does kind of a 360 view of the youth. So the, there's the schools and the parents, and everybody sort of contributes, and of course the youth themselves contribute, and it's, it's going to be focused on functioning. You know, how are they dealing with stuff? How are they getting through life? things like that, and see if we can incorporate this a little bit over time and back into maybe primary care to just kind of check in periodically because, you know, uh, anxiety and, and depression, tend, people have those tendencies. I mean, those don't necessarily go away right. just because you learn the skills to manage it. doesn't mean you don't have some genetic nope. component and just part of who you are. And, uh, you yeah, know, there's a lot of benefit, in fact, to having that. Uh, people who don't ever experience sadness or ever experience anxiety you know, don't necessarily function all that well either. You know, those are some some components that are needed for life as well. So I, a long answer to a short question, but uh, we're still working with it, but we've got a couple of tools in place. Great, thank you. First, I want to say that a lot of the things that you just described, uh, these skills that we're learning, I think that this is the type of stuff, life skills in general, that we've been not putting in our, our the public schools and private schools for, for middle-aged students Middle aged, <laughs> middle school <laughs> students. Yeah. Well, hey, middle middle school students, and and I really think that such a thing would be so so well incorporated and and so beneficial to kids these days. Um, I wish we could see that. Secondly, um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, Sammy's mother Maya. Is there some sort of a parental track in the Aspire program? Um, I, I don't know how to call it a track. It's uh, they they re- well, I guess you could. They're required to come. I mean, we make that a requirement. Uh, we don't we don't say no. 
Uh, you can't, you know, uh, if they uh, if they if they won't attend, or sometimes you'll have a parent meaning no to the child. We're going we're gonna to take the we're going to take the youth no matter what. But we really need to get the patients, the parents engaged, and for a few reasons. And I'll, I'll just briefly go over that. So we prefer both parents to come, uh, and we've had groups where all the parents have come, and they've been hard to find enough chairs to fit everybody in the room. And that's great when that happens. We've also had situations where the parents cannot stand the sight of each other, and everything that's communicated is through a third party. They don't even write emails to each other. That happens. Wow. So that's yeah. one come, and they alternate. So that we've had to deal with that. Many times, in fact, uh, we have a parents that won't come because the other parent is a source of stress in the family, you know, and not willing to uh, uh, using drugs and drinking every day. And they're not going to attend because that's going to they see that as maybe confrontational. They don't embarrassed by their behavior and uh, not want to deal with it or not supportive of it, of the of the of the of the work at all. So we run across all the situations. But when the parents come, it's so much more powerful because the parents being there. Um, they end up learning what the youth is going through, and they end up really buying into it. I mean, they get it. You know, hey, wow, this is good stuff. This isn't just, you know, you're in a crazy mental health program, whatever that means, and, you know, some kind of therapy thing that they're working through and how to, you know, stuff that's kind of gobbledygook. This is stuff that they understand. It's like a learner's manual for life, right? So they learn how this stuff functions and how we function as mature thinking people. Um, oh, geez, sign, sign me up. Can I take yeah. this? <laughs> I think it's incredible that, that you hit everybody. You know, so often we have these things, and, and you're right, the, the mental health work, it needs to be done by the person experiencing the mental health crisis, and everybody else just walks away. And of course, we, we don't act that way if, if a family member is diagnosed with cancer, or if a family member, you know, becomes handicapped or in a wheelchair, we, we educate those around us so that that person can get the best possible care. But for some reason, people with mental illness or mental health issues are often left to fend for themselves. And it's, it's an isolating illness in the best case scenario, but when you're told even from a treatment standpoint that, oh no, this is just you, you're on your own, uh, it, it's it's difficult. So I, I, I applaud this portion of it uh, along with all of the other portions. It's it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Well, it's a different way of conceptualizing these conditions too. Uh, you know, we conceptualize mental illness as an illness often. We conceptualize it as diagnoses and something wrong with the person. And I mean, I, I get it. Uh, I mean, these are conditions, right? I mean, we don't want to invalidate it and say, you know, these don't exist or something like that. But it, we, they exist in a different way, which is that you're overwhelmed by your symptoms. And if you can learn how to manage those symptoms and if people around you can help support you in managing those symptoms, you're going to have good outcomes typically, right? It's good. It's what works, whether it's uh, they need support around their housing or their, you know, it depends on the level of person. And there's a, there's a whole range of these conditions. You know, there's people with severe mental health conditions that are, you know, obviously in the streets and screaming and jails and prisons and so forth. And then there's uh, folks that are highly functioning, like we were seeing in the Silicon Valley. You know, Sammy, uh, you, sure, you talk about this much better from her experience, but it's not unusual for us to have youth in our Inspire program whose big stress was they got first beat that they ever got, right? Or not being able to meet the expectations of being able to go to Stanford. And we've had youth in the program that can't get out of bed. They're, uh, you know, from a, from a whole different cultural experience and, and have absolute school refusal. We have them as well. And that group actually works really well together. They're all people. They're all living beings, youth, young people experiencing stress in life. And so uh, it typically works well uh, in, in the same type of group. But see, these are just a spread of conditions is sort of what I'm getting at here. And if we can take some of that stigma out of what a quote unquote mental illness is and talk about it as symptoms, it becomes much more tangible, real, and then the therapy becomes much more obvious you know it's about functioning that's really what it's about well said well we're uh, we're running low on time here but i want to give sammy the last question uh, sammy can you talk about how you learned about the program and but most importantly what you got out of it you know it was actually it was really hard finding the program actually because you know nobody really talks about mental illness and not a lot of people you know, are really open about it. So it was it was very difficult finding it. We actually found it through like one of my mom's friends who had come to us talking about it. And so it and it was kind of frustrating because, you know, it didn't really come from like a primary source like, oh, here, you should go to this program. You know, we had to really dig and search for it. So um, it was really frustrating in that sense. And as far as it goes for one of the biggest things that I think I took away from the program, I think what I learned from it is that in life 
everyone has their ups and everyone has their downs, right? And what the Aspire program was really good at doing is it helped me learn skills to navigate through these ups and downs and know that even when I'm at a low point in my life, I now know how to kind of look at life in a different light and take a step back from the problem and learn, you know, and apply these skills that I learned throughout the program to kind of know that, you know, I will get through this and this is not an end all um, situation. But I think these skills basically just help me have a more balanced life in the end. So great. That's great. Thank you, everyone, for agreeing to be on the show. Michael, Sammy, it, it's fantastic. Sammy, this is week two for you. It's incredible. Uh, Michael, this is a great program with great outcomes. Uh, obviously, I'm in Ohio, not California. I'd like to see it spread. Uh, we talked last week about if we're not willing to have these conversations, we're not going to be able to find solutions. And if we can't find solutions, that people that could lead otherwise typical lives aren't going to be able to. So I, I hope this work really takes off uh, around all of the United States and, and all of the world. So thank you, both of you, for being willing to be on the uh, the front lines of this. Uh, thanks thank for inviting us. Yeah. Yes, thanks. thanks for being on the show. It's it's been It's been great. Thank you so much. All right, well, that's a wrap for this week's The Psych Central Show. Next week, we will have part three of three. Sammy, are you going to join us next week as well? I will be there, yes. All right, well, we will contact you then, and we look forward to seeing everybody. And my name is Gabe Howard. With me, as always, is Vincent M. Wales, and we're out. Thanks, everyone. PsychCentral.com is the Internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website. Psych Central is overseen by Dr. John Grohall, a mental health expert and one of the pioneering leaders in online mental health. Our host, Gabe Howard, is a professional speaker, award-winning writer, and mental health advocate. You can find more information on Gabe and his work at GabeHoward.com. Vincent M. Wales is an award-winning speculative fiction novelist and suicide prevention crisis counselor. You can find more information on Vincent at VincentMWales.com. If you have feedback about the show, please email talkback at psychcentral.com.